Charlie's a friend, okay? Uh, I don't need to hear about In-N-Out Burger before I've had a chance to eat dinner, okay? <laughs> That's just, listen, it's a rookie mistake, but don't let it happen again at one of these conferences. Because my stomach is outraged. I, I love In-N-Out Burger so much that I have considered moving to California. I live in New York City, we don't have In-N-Out Burger. Um, but uh, we have a lot of stuff California has, like the crime and all that, you know, we have that. Uh, but In-N-Out Burger, not yet. Uh, I also thought that uh, all that Michael Knowles, the Dante stuff, way too highbrow and Catholic. I rebuke that. Mike, no Mike is also a friend, I rebuke you. I rebuke you. Um, I, there's so much I wanna say and, and so uh, little time, so l let me just leap in. Um, I want, I'm here to talk to you about um, my new book, Letter to the American Church. Now I have to be blunt, you're, thank you. Um, now if you've already read the book, you can just go and have a cigarette break because I'm just gonna talk about what you already know. But uh, the, uh, the fact is that we, we all, most of us, if you believe in Jesus, you know that the Lord wants to lead you in your life and in your career, you know that, right? Nonetheless, you're surprised when he does it, right? Like whenever the Lord does stuff, you know he could do it, but when he does it, you're surprised, uh, which, is, which is normal. It's not really a lack of faith, it could be, but often it's just a, you're blessed, right? And it's so obvious to me, astonishingly obvious, crazy obvious, that the Lord created me uh, and called me to write the book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer that came out in 2010. Now when I was writing it, I'll be honest with you, when I was writing it, it was, it was a painful experience. It was a tr spiritual trial. I'm not gonna give you the details because uh, Hutz went long and I don't have time. No, actually he did not. He did not, I was looking at the clock. He nailed it. The other people went long. Um, but I'm, I'm not kidding, writing that book um, was God's calling on my life. And I can say this humbly, it's not like I had a great idea. I got a great idea for a book. Believe me when I tell you, please believe me when I tell you, I expected nothing to come of that book. I just thought, I'm gonna write this. Uh, it's an important story. Uh, my mother, uh, with whom I spoke earlier today, she'll be 89, um, she grew up in Germany during the rise of the Nazis. Um, this is personal for me. I have relatives uh, in Germany. This is, uh, I'm still closely related uh, to my German relatives. I'm not like German, you know, like 12 uh, uh, generations back. I mean, this is, this is real for me. So I grew up with this. And when I heard the story of Bonhoeffer, I knew, uh, I said, this is, first of all, I had never heard it before because I, you know, I grew up in a working class home. Don't let the double-breasted blazer fool you, all right? I grew up in a working class home. And, uh, but by the grace of God, I was able to go to Yale University, which is a fine communist institution in New, ha New Haven, <laughs> Connecticut. Uh, and it is deeply evil, but in the best sense of, of evil. Um, and so I grew up with a mother who experienced growing up in Nazi Germany, which then became East Germany, so taken over the, by the communists, by the, by the Stalinists, and she escaped at age 17 from communism. My father grew up in Greece. He will be 96 next month, praise the Lord. And he grew up in Greece where the communists tried to take over uh, a Greece. So my parents met in an English class in New York City um, in 1956. And they raised me without trying to. They weren't like evangelical Christians or big uh, uh, conservatives, but they were reality-based. They understood the, evens, the difference between good and evil. And at this point, if you're reality-based, you're pretty conservative. Um, so, uh, I see a, a Greek guy that I grew up with right there. I can't believe you're here, Kakadelis. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I'm sure I've got many friends here and a number of former friends, by the way. I, 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 well, let, me, let me be honest. I, Pay me the $40 back and we're good, but I will not have it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be quiet about it anymore. Um, so I grew up, and I think sometimes 
Christians, okay, I'm not a pastor, but you know, I'm a born-again believer, and the most important thing in my life is Jesus. But sometimes I think Christians can be very religious in the negative sense, right? Uh, Bonhoeffer talked about religionless Christianity. Religion can become, I mean, Jesus really came to kill religion, right? And to say, whatever you do to earn your way to heaven, your religious acts, you can't get there from here. I need to come down to you. Whole new paradigm, right? And so, I forgot my point. Um, oh, so, so Christians, we can often get really theological and we get really religious and we forget that truth is truth. There's no such thing as Christian truth any more than there is a Christian apple or a Christian bird or a Christian tree. The fact of the matter is all of reality is created by the Lord, who, who by the way is a Christian, and, <laughs> and all of reality is at this moment, every electron going around every atom in the universe, in the universe, in the vast universe, is going around the nuclei, uh, the nucleus of that atom because of Jesus now. Now, so what that means is everything is Christian. So you don't need to label it Christian, okay? Truth doesn't need to be Christian truth. It's either true or it's a lie. It's either reality or it's a lie. The Lord is behind all of truth and reality. And what we forget, but we're being reminded now as the world goes insane, we're reminded that you don't know, need to be a Christian to know that men can't become women, women can't become men, one plus one equals two. That's not like Christian math. And so in a way, all of reality points to the Lord. But now more than ever, as things go crazy, people are looking around and they're thinking, uh, what, what is happening? People who are not believers are understanding more and more and more that something is off. It's not a political problem. It's evil. Okay? When, when, when Target, you know, hires a Satanist to produce cool swag, you know, you don't need to be a born-again believer to understand something is deeply sick in America. And by the way, if you ever go to Target again, you're part of the problem. Now, why do, I, why do I say that? I mean, if you have no choice or whatever, I'm not trying to be, let's not drive ourselves crazy, but if Christians can't make that kind of a sacrifice, you deserve the country to go to hell. And, and by the way, here's the, here's the bad news. The Lord will hold you accountable that it went to hell. Because I'll tell you what, there are tons of non-Christians who get this stuff. They're trying to raise their children in this insane world. And they're looking around and they're wondering, is it just me? Five minutes ago, somebody decided there's more than two genders. Like, when did that happen? Who decided that? That's crazy. Is there anybody willing to speak up? My children are being propagandized and driven insane. And is there anybody willing to speak up? And you know who's supposed to do that? The Church of Jesus Christ. So, I, I say all that because originally I started, I was talking about my parents. In other words, my parents raised me to understand a number of things. And it's not because, you know, they got it from their evangelical home group teaching, okay? There is evil in the world, okay? If you're an American, only Americans could be dumb enough and spoiled enough to think that maybe we've kind of evolved past evil. But if you come from a communist country, you know there is evil in the world, you know there's darkness in the world, you know freedom is beautiful, and you know America is glorious, and you want to go there because you have experienced that. But if you grew up in America, most of us who grew up here, we cannot comprehend and we haven't had to comprehend until recently how easily we can lose everything we thought was normal. We thought what we had was normal. And the fact of the matter is if you've come from another country or your parents came from another country or you know people who came from some place where that's not normal, 
They know that there's a difference between good and evil. They know there's such a thing as evil. They know that if you don't support what we have here and fight for what we have here, it can get very, 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 very bad. Far worse than anything you can imagine. And I believe the Lord in his grace is allowing us to see how quickly it can get really sick and really evil and really bad in his mercy to wake us up and to make us understand that I can't sit this one out. I can't say, well, the pendulum swims back and forth. Yeah, I mean, if you think it's okay, the pendulum swims back and forth to the death camps where millions of Jews are murdered and their children are murdered. If you think that's cool that the pendulum swings and you're just going to sit back. But nobody believes that. You know that if things can get that bad and you do nothing about it, you're guilty, right? But we've all, and I say we all, myself included, we've all been lulled into thinking that everything's fine, I don't need to do anything, and obviously many pastors think like, I can just preach the gospel, I don't need to get into some of this stuff. We are living at a time where it is now, by God's grace, impossible not to get into some of that stuff, because that, some of that stuff has come to you, and it's come to your children and to your grandchildren. But this is God's mercy. I want to be honest with you. This is God's mercy. This is Romans 8, 28. That as things fall apart on a level we can't even comprehend, the madness, the stupidity, the, the, the absolute lunacy of things we've seen just in the last few years. I mean, I remember the first time I heard somebody talk about defund the police. I thought, what? <laughs> like, what? That's like the dumbest thing I ever heard. What, what do you mean by that? Surely you don't actually mean that because that's like the dumbest thing I ever heard. Like, what do you mean? Um, Th th and that's one example, the idea that like we can't have borders. You're like, wait, wait, wait excuse me, what do you mean? What do you mean? You don't mean, you don't really mean that, right? Th these things are like madness, okay? But there's a brazenness to evil now that the Lord has allowed for his purposes to wake up his sleeping church, to wake up, to wake up the remnant who might still be Awakened, because not everyone will wake up. Some people have, have made their bed in whatever it is that makes them comfortable, and they just can't go there. They, they can't go there. In any event, I, I mentioned my, my mother and father because there's no doubt that I didn't need to accept Jesus to understand, because I know their stories, how bad things can get and how blessed, how outrageously blessed we are in this country. It's just a fact. Now, if we don't do anything about it, if we take it for granted, you know, it's like having a ton of money and, and, and not do anything with it. Clearly, the Lord, if he blesses you, you're blessed to be a blessing. So it doesn't matter how he's blessed you or with what, you're blessed to be a blessing. So if you have money, if you have freedom, if you have a voice, if you have a talent, if you have beauty, whatever God has given you, he's given you for his purposes to use to bless others who don't have it. And we in this country have had un an unfathomable level of freedom and flourishing and riches, but we've kind of acted like it's normal. But now we're living in a time where seeing the Lord has allowed a lot of it to go away and a lot of madness to come in to say, are you gonna wake up now? Are you gonna stand now? What's it going to take? These things didn't just happen in the past. Now, I, I say, God called me to write the Bonhoeffer book. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but I know that now uh, because it was a tremendous spiritual trial to write that book. It, it really was, was a painful, difficult thing, but the Lord spoke to me in a dream. I believe in miracles. Anybody here believe in the Holy Spirit? I'm just curious. Anybody? All right, so a few, a few of you. The Lord spoke to me in a very dramatically miraculous way about the book. A as a way, it seems to me, to encourage me not to kill myself during the writing of it. Now, I'm only half joking. Uh, it was really a trial. But I look back because when I wrote the book, I remember my goal was simply to tell the story of a brave man who happened to be German, since I'm German, and who, because of his faith in Jesus, spoke up for the Jews and spoke against the Nazis. I thought, what a wild, amazing story of Christian faith that nobody knows, needs to be told. And I just, I just wanted to tell that story. But while I was telling the story, I, I kept kind of saying, there's stuff in here that seems familiar. It's like I can smell this 
around the corner in my country, surely not in my lifetime, but there's something weird in telling the story of Bonhoeffer. And then as the years passed, I realized, yes, yes, it's exactly the same story. People would say, how could that happen in a country like Germany? Now, if you think the Germans are uniquely evil, you're as racist as the person who thinks the Jews are uniquely evil, right? You are as evil, and I am as evil as the Germans. The Lord can deliver us from evil, but if, if you think, like, well, that's just a weird outlier, just a weird thing that happened back then, it can't happen again, we have to try to make sense, how did that happen? And the more time passed, and more people say, how, how would that happen in a, in a culturally sophisticated, uh, pretty Christian nation? Like, how did that happen? Well, the answer is it happened exactly as it is happening now here. Exactly the same excuses for inaction. The same, people didn't say, hey, we want to worship Satan or we want to worship Hitler. Tons and tons of pastors were deceived. Good men. They were not all evil men. They were not all cowards. Good people were deceived. They were deceived because they, they had bought these lies that Romans 13, like that's everything that there is to say about, you know, whether we stand up to the government. Evidently, they forgot about the book of Esther. I don't know if that's too Jewish or something, but they forgot about the book of Esther. Like all of scripture makes it pretty clear you do not obey unjust laws uh, Dr. King. But the idea, if, you, if you're kind of living in a culture and, you know, there's like an echo chamber, like Romans 13, Romans 13, Romans 13 yeah, we're all good. We're not going to do anything. So, like, whatever it is, like vaccine mandates, shut your church down, whatever, whatever, whatever. We, we're there now, right? Like, where you suddenly realize, I have a choice to make. It may cost me something. It's not just other people in other cultures. People in Africa and the Middle East and China that, that have to pay a price for their faith. We may have to pay a price for our faith. But as someone said earlier tonight, the, po the point is, excuse me, Jesus, we, we claim to believe that Jesus defeated death on the cross. If that is true, I no longer fear death. Because when you kill me, I don't die. Now, a lot of us kind of hope that's true, but the Lord does not want you to hope that that's true. He, he, he needs you to know that that is true because it is true. And in a way, you can't really live as a Christian unless you know that that is true. And the story of Bonhoeffer shows us the picture of a man who knew that that was true. And when you know that's true, you live differently and you die differently. And that's the whole point, right? So Bonhoeffer, when I, when I was writing that story, I saw these parallels. And then suddenly, in the last few years, I realized this has suddenly come upon us, that, that the fruit of our silence as an American church uh, has si suddenly come upon us. And now what are we going to do about it? And so the, the, the story, um, the longest book I ever wrote is the Bonhoeffer book. The shortest book I ever wrote is this new book called Letter to the American Church. For, by sure, for sure, the shortest book I ever wrote. But the point of the book, I hate kids, by the way. In my contract, it says no children, no children in the audience. Come on. It's in my contract. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> you can only say that if you actually love kids. You know that, right? Um, so so the, the fact of the matter is that when I wrote the book Letter to the American Church, my thesis in the book, and, and this is the funny thing, is like, you you know, I want to be wrong. I, 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 wanna, I want people, you know, to show me, like, Eric, Eric, you're just being a hothead and it's not true. But unfortunately, I know that this is true. I know, f first, that the silence of the church in Germany led to the rise of the Nazis, right? Now, you have to understand how that worked, and I'll explain that in a minute. But the silence of the church in Germany led to the rise of of satanic evil under the Nazis, okay? They did not see it coming. We cannot blame them in the way that, like, well, they knew exactly what was gonna happen and they didn't speak up anyway. Many of them didn't. Bonhoeffer tried to get them to wake up. He tried and tried and tried. It's always, I always think of, of Gulliver being tied down by the Lilliputians, right? Like the Nazis thought, if we can just get the church 
to, to stay asleep a little longer. It's like the Lilliputians tying down Gulliver. And, and if he wakes up at any moment, they're dead. But if they can keep him sleeping and just tie him down, another thread, another thread, another thread, at some point, game over, he's done. And so the question for Bonhoeffer was, can I get the church to wake up before it's too late? And we know the answer. The answer is no. Like many of the Old Testament prophets, he spoke to the people of God and said, you need to be the people of God. And they hesitated and hesitated and hesitated. And then suddenly, too late, game over, you're done. Now, the point of this book, Letter to the American Church, is to say that exactly what happened then is happening now. Exactly. Now, when I say exactly, on the one hand, it's exactly. Of course, it's always going to be different. It's never going to be exactly the same thing. In, in other words, what you were dealing with then was a hypertrophied kind of nationalism, okay? Today, you know, you're dealing with globalism, right? So you'll notice that uh, nationalism suddenly is a very bad thing, very Hitler, Hitler-esque, right? Well, no. Like, if, 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 the, if the nation is formed in the image of Adolf Hitler, yeah, that's bad. But if the nation is the United States of America, uh, which is the greatest, freest nation in the history of the world, that has expanded its freedom around the world and has expanded its freedom over time, seven, I got the, the, the number recently, over 700,000 men died in the Civil War. We ended slavery in this country. A lot of things, freedoms have been expanded in this country. And we have become the most free country in the history of the world. And so, to some extent, we have forgotten that what we have is not normal. And we got into the habit of being apolitical somehow, right? As though the scripture is crystal clear on that. Now, we're not talking about making an idol of politics. And by the way, in case you didn't know, you shouldn't make an idol of anything. Uh, anything. So if you're making an idol of politics, you can make an idol as like, well, you know, you love your family too much. You need to choose. It's either Jesus or your family, right? Now, anything can become an idol. But we need to be a little realistic. You don't tell people, don't love your family. Your love of Jesus ought to really make you love your family and your spouse more, right? Similarly, your love of God would make you love your country in a healthy way, not in an unhealthy way where politics becomes your God. But the idea that if you're a Christian, you have to be utterly apolitical, it, it becomes immediately preposterous. Because if, if you are against slavery, that's, that became political. That became a political issue. And there were pastors in this country, in this state, who said, we don't want to take a, take a stand on the slavery issue because, you know, we're all about evangelism. And they were silent in the face of that satanic evil. Wilberforce, we all, if you read my book, Amazing Grace, about Wilberforce, um, you know that here's a man who, because of his faith in Jesus, he goes to his friend John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. I know a lot of you guys think Tony Bennett uh, wrote that. I want to be clear, because I, I did the research. That was John Newton. He wrote Amazing Grace, okay? Wilberforce goes to him and says, I've now been born again. I didn't use those words, but like, I've got to get out of politics, right? What does John Newton say? John Newton says, no. It seems that the Lord has raised you up in politics for such a time as this so that you will use your faith in politics to bring Jesus and his views to bear in this culture. We need you. And so Wilberforce uses politics and anything else he can use, including the culture, to bring about the eradication of the slave trade in the British Empire. We don't say, Wilberforce is too political. Now, if you say that, you're an idiot. So maybe, maybe you say that, but don't say it publicly. <laughs> he brings his faith into politics, and he understands that this is going to bless innumerable people bringing my faith into politics. But, of course, you have voices today that say, ah, ah, he's trying to establish a theocracy. Look, folks. 
you, you, there comes a time, I, was, I, I just came from the NRB uh, in, in Orlando, uh, and we had a panel in the, in the, yesterday morning on, you know, the question of Christian nationalism, right? And, and like my response to Christian nationalism in a nutshell is a, a, a horse laugh. Like when people invent a term just to shut you up, if you're, if you're responding too much to that or at all, you're casting your pearls before swine. Jesus, Jesus, who, whose opinions I take kind of seriously, said, cast not your pearls before swine. In other words, there's a time that you do not, you, you, you do not spend God's time that he's given you and God's energy and God's talent arguing with a fool in his folly there's a time you have to have discernment and say, you are just trying to shut me up. I see what you're doing. You're not interested in the truth. You're simply trying to tell me, excuse me, shut up, but I don't know how to shut you up because I don't have the argument to shut you up. So I'll invent a term to shut you up. And it will work many, many, many times. And it has worked on the church. Not just that term, any other term anybody can throw at you. The term you're being very political. People are like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, that'll never happen again. I have, no, I have no opinion on anything, you know. I have no opinion on killing the unborn. I don't want, I don't want to talk about that because that's divisive. You know, we could lose some tithers. You are supposed to be, I mean, listen, you don't need to be a Christian to be free to speak. Just as an American, patriots have died so that you can say whatever you want, whether it's right or wrong, anytime you want. We have this thing called people have died for this. But Christians have infinitely less excuse because Jesus died for us that we would be genuinely freed from fear of man and we can say anything we like. So even the idea that I got to be careful what I say from the pulpit, I don't want to be too political because the five ones to three, that idea is not biblical. That idea is not biblical. And, and I write in the book, a Letter to the American Church, I, I, I explain how it is that this came upon us. Lyndon Johnson, one of the most corrupt politicians in the history of this country, right? Uh, a really unpleasant man. He brought, as when he was a senator, uh, into the tax code, this thing like, I'll fix the churches. They're saying things about me I don't like, I'll fix them. So they put that in there. And Americans who are, you know, just uh, uh, impossibly nice, even when we shouldn't be nice, said like, oh, okay, we'll go along with that. And we allowed that, preposterous notion that we can't be political to, to be like, okay, well, look, we'll take that deal. That is, that is not God's idea. Right. And, and we should be testing that from our pulpits every day. It's like, come and get me. Come and get my 501c3 status because it's frankly not right. I mean, if, if I know that something is wicked or I know that somebody is running for office who is going to do unbelievable harm to people, that their policies are wicked policies, and, but I can't talk about that from my pulpit, or I can't mention their name. I have to be very, very careful. Folks, we've muzzled ourselves. And, and the fact of the matter is, it's not biblical. It is not, if it were biblical, I would say, all right, all right, I get it. But it's not, but we act as though it's biblical. We've somehow accepted it, and we've censored ourselves. So the thesis of my book, Letter to the American Church, which, and I, and I you know, give specifics, is that the silence of the American church has led to where we are now. And we've been silent over decades, and of course not everyone has been silent and not everybody on, on every subject, but what I'm trying to say is generally speaking, we've kind of acted like, well, we don't want controversy. We're gonna carve out a third way. We're gonna carve out this middle way where, where you know, and, and listen, uh, Tim Keller just passed away. He, he was someone I knew for years and I, I loved him. But on this thing, he, he didn't get it wrong initially. And in my book, I mentioned this because I think it needs saying. He's someone that I just adored him. And when he would say, you know, when I was at his church with my wife, and he would say, he would say well, you know, the liberal view says this, and the conservative view says this, but the gospel says this. It was a brilliant idea, and most of the time makes sense. But there comes a time, if the culture changes extremely dramatically, uh, if, if the head of the Democratic Party is no longer, for example, Tip O'Neill, if, if, if a party is lurching away from the values that 
everyone used to agree on, every single American and politician used to agree on, it, to, to pretend that, well, there's the left and there's the right, it's no longer we all agree on stuff and here are our little differences. Now, you, you, you have to deal with the fact that many people, and by the way, obviously in both parties, right. that, that have, they have sold their souls for power. And, and when somebody sells his soul for power, you, you have to say, well, uh, I'm, ag I'm against that. And these are moral issues. Whether we're talking about corruption, uh, authoritarian uh, instincts that, that have, we've seen in the last couple of years, if, if you don't understand that those are moral issues that affect everybody. Um, so ultimately, we, we're obliged to go beyond the very you know, convenient idea that, well, we're not going to be political. There's the left here, there's the right here, and then there's the gospel. I remember when that was mostly true. But, but if you're talking, for example, about cultural Marxism, you're talking about critical race theory, you're talking about things that are fundamentally atheistic, okay? BLM was an atheistic organization. They, they, they were a culturally Marxist, atheistic organization. If you're atheistic, where do you even get the idea that racism is wrong. In other words, I know it's wrong, but I know why it's wrong. It's wrong because the scripture is clear that we're all made in God's image, we're all equal in God's sight. That's a biblical idea. If you don't believe in the Bible or you don't believe in God, tell me why anything is wrong. Tell me why, why couldn't some races be more evolved than others? Because if you don't believe in God, that's what the eugenicists believed uh, that, that's what Margaret Sanger believed, and it's what Hitler believed, and it's what many people believed. It was science. You got to go with the science, right? Well, the scripture says that's wrong. But we are suddenly dealing with things that we haven't dealt with before. So cultural Marxism really redefines everything. And because we're nice, especially pastors, we want to be nice, we kind of open the door to these things a little bit. You say, well, they have a point. Well, at the end of the day, they, they don't have a point. They're bringing emotion. They're, bringing, they're, they're basically manipulating you. Uh, and they're bringing wicked atheistic ideas into your community, into your church. And here, here's the bottom line. It's going to hurt people. And because it's going to hurt people, it's going to destroy lives, whether it's transgender lunacy, whether it's critical uh, race theory, whether it's the idea that borders are racist. And any of these ideas are going to harm people. If you know that, then you have an obligation to talk about that, to help people understand that if we open up our border and fentanyl comes in and, and Mexican drug cartels are, are trafficking children, okay? I'm sorry, folks, but when you're dealing, when you're talking about child rape, I mean, I, I don't know how it's possible for us to say, well, you know, there's two sides to that's a complicated story. We have been, we have been bullied into silence. And the fact is that the Lord demands of us that we be a voice for the voiceless. Bonhoeffer says the, the, the church is the conscience of the state. So he was trying to speak to pastors in, in his day. And I promise you, they didn't know what was coming. They didn't know what was coming. But he was trying to speak to them, trying to get them to understand that if, if you connect the dots, if you understand what the Nazis are saying and where they come from and where they're going, if you speak now against it, you have the cultural power as the Church of Jesus Christ to stand against it. And, I, and I'm here to tell you that's a fact. The church in Germany was so powerful that if they had linked arms and said, yes, we will stand against this, Believe me, Bonhoeffer knew what he was talking about. There were many other they, they knew the church had the power to do this. But it, it, this is a fact that, that I just have to throw in, and, it, and it's in the book. There's a chapter in the book called 12,000 Pastors. Some of you are familiar with the Barman Declaration. When the Nazis took power, okay, a number of very bright pastors immediately said, okay, we, now we've got a problem here. The Nazis are redefining everything all, along racial lines. That's not biblical. And the worst of it is that they are saying that the state 
can control the church, right? Now, we don't have that problem in America. We're, we're not supposed to. We have separation of church and state. We have the idea that the government has no business telling any church or any person what to believe or how to worship or whatever. We have that in our founding documents. So, so when a governor or a mayor or whatever tells you, you know, you got to do, you know, you got to shut down your church or you got to do this, you got to do that, you know where to tell them where to go. To the founding documents. Okay? But in Germany, in Germany, they didn't have founding documents that separated the church from the state. What they had was a, a kind of confused idea on that. And the Nazis played on that. Because when the Kaiser was the head of the German state, they had a friendly relationship with the church. But now Hitler is the head. And a lot of pastors dithered. They were confused. Romans 13. Uh, what do we do? And so Bonhoeffer and some other pastors said, okay, right now we need to establish in the Barman Declaration that the church belongs to Jesus Christ and the state has no jurisdiction, none, and we will stand. So they create the Barman Declaration. But in the chapter called 12,000 Pastors, I say that there were 18,000 Lutheran pastors in Germany around this time. By 1935, the, the cancel culture, the pressure, the bullying by the Nazis, which obviously we're seeing very dramatically similar stuff here, had, had, had affected enough of these pastors so that there were only about 3,000 of the 18,000 by 1935 who were willing to stand boldly against the German state, the Nazi state, and say, we are the church and we will not bow to the church. 3,000. At the other end of the spectrum, you had about 3,000 of the 18,000 who were the equivalent of just like woke, loony, like whatever the New York Times says, we're, that's it. That's our holy writ. Basically, they were like utterly Nazi, okay? So they were apostate, her heretical, completely sold out to the Nazis. 3,000 on that end of the spectrum. But here's the punchline. In between the 3,000 heroes and the 3,000 ultra pro Nazis were 12,000 pastors who somehow persuaded themselves like, hey, we don't need to decide. We don't need to choose. We don't want to stick our necks out. We don't need to speak. We're going to keep our mouths shut. Now, folks, it was the silence of those 12,000 pastors their religious excuses, they had religious excuses for not speaking. We just want to preach the gospel. Well, what dead gospel are you preaching when you do not care that Jews are going to go in boxcars with their children and grandparents to death camps? Like, what gospel, what gospel are you preaching? At that point, you're the blind leading the blind. You, 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 are, you have nothing. You know, it, it, it's, it's Jesus speaking to, to the Pharisees. You, if you do not speak the truth, if you do not speak up, be a voice for the voiceless, who cares about whatever gospel you think you're preaching? Bonhoeffer said famously, you know, un unless you speak up for the Jews, you, you, you must not sing Gregorian chants. In other words, don't sing your worship songs if you are not speaking up for the Jews. God is not interested in your worship, your fake worship, because it's fake, because you are not living out your faith where it matters. You're being silent. And the Lord knows you're not loving your neighbor if you're being silent, if you're saying nothing. He knows, and he's not interested in, in your sacrifices, right? He's not interested in whatever it is that you're pretending to do and to give him when he has asked you, you claim to believe he defeated death on the cross, but you're not living that way. It's a scandal. So Bonhoeffer was trying to wake people up, and so there were 12,000 pastors, and it was the silence of those 12,000 pastors, many of whom were good men that enabled satanic evil to take over that nation. And at some point, game over, you're done. So that, to my mind, is what I see in America today. We have a number of heroes, Rob McCoy. Uh, by the way, Rob, uh, you know, says he's, he's Charlie's pastor. Today in the lobby, I met nine guys who claim that. 
I know, Rob. No, seriously, I'm, no, but it's true, I am, I am Charlie's haberdasher. I wanna, be, I wanna be very clear about that. And I'm humbled that he considers me his haberdasher. No, but I, I gotta tell you, there are heroic pastors, many of whom in this room now, who have stood up or who are now realizing I need to stand up. There are many. And, but the problem is not the woke crazies that will hang whatever flag you ask them to. I mean, when they hung swastikas outside of those churches, they did not know that this is gonna lead to the death camps. They, they were just trying to go along with the crowd. They didn't wanna be unpopular. They just wanted an opportunity to preach the gospel. They didn't understand, they didn't discern the times that now is the time to speak up. Now is the time to join with your brothers and sisters. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. So similarly, in my mind today, there are heroic pastors and churches, and I'm meeting them all over the country. They're the only ones that invite me anymore. But it's kind of funny because you're meeting all these heroes. So they exist. They exist, and it's wonderful. And we know that there are people on the other end that they will believe and say anything. But the question is, the 12,000 pastors in the middle, I don't know how many that is in America, but it's the same thing. You don't need all of them. You don't need all of them to join the 3,000. Maybe, as Charlie said earlier, maybe you need 10%, 20%. You need some of them who are being silent now to say, you know what? I didn't see what was happening, but I kind of get it now, and I am now going to live heroically. I'm going to live as though I actually believe Jesus defeated death on the cross. I'm not going to stay in my theological lane because that's a lie from the pit of hell. You know, Abraham Kuyper, the famous Dutch theologian, he's so famous you have to say he's famous, the famous <laughs> Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper, whom Chuck Colson pretty much quoted in every speech, he said there is not one square inch in all of creation over which Jesus Christ, who is sovereign, does not say, mine. The Lord wants us not to stay in our theological lane, in our little gospel lane, in our religious lane. He says the point of that is for you to take the Lord and his theology and his values into every other lane in existence. You are to bring your faith and your Lord and his values to bear everywhere you can, in politics, in culture, in medicine, in media, anywhere you can. Because if you believe God is who he said he is, you know that when you do that, it will bless people. It will not oppress people. You, we cannot force people to believe what we want them to believe. We know that that's preposterous. But we know that God has called us to take his values out of the church and into the world. And so if the end goal of church is playing church on Sunday morning, then you realize you've, you've missed it. You've been fooled into, into playing church. The Lord wants you to be the church. And the fact is that when the church is the church, it is mind-blowing what we can accomplish in this world. I want to remind you okay, that it is out of the churches that the civil rights movement came. Because churches understand the idea, okay, that we're all made in God's image. But it became a political movement. Why? Because these ideas of God's became enshrined in our laws. Because we, we, we persuaded people this is right and true and we want to be governed in a way that we no longer have these kinds of demonic laws in our country. I, I want to say that the, 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 the abolition of slavery, that was led by believers. Most of you know that story. Born again believers, not the churchgoers, but the, the Jesus freaks, the maniacs who really believed what the Bible said, said we need to take God's values and enshrine them in our laws. We need to abolish the slave trade in Britain and abolish slavery. We need to do that. When you bring God's values into the culture, whether you use politics or whatever you do, you bless people. And by the way, church, if we don't do that, the Lord holds us accountable because he has said to us that we're to love him with everything we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves. In other words, we're not to be timid and religious 
And we're not just to say, well, I'm just going to focus on gospel-related issues. At the end of the day, everything's a gospel-related issue. If, if you don't care about, uh, as I mentioned, child rape, sex trafficking. Uh, I recently at Socrates in the City had a guest, Yomi Park. Some of you know her. She escaped North Korea. The nightmare she describes, this is one of these people co who comes from a, a place where they have, have experienced satanic evil in a nation. And when you hear that story, you feel ashamed because you have power to do something about it. You have power. We have power. And the church has the Holy Spirit. And, and, and there are people around the world looking to us to bring our faith to bear on absolutely everything, everywhere we go. So there, there, there's still people in our culture saying, I don't want to go there. Uh, I don't want to, uh, it's all about faith. Uh, I, I don't need to get involved in these different I issues. Now, the book is titled Letter to the American Church, but I'll tell you, originally I was going to call it Faith Without Works is Dead. I believe it was Oscar Wilde who said that. <laughs> faith Without Works is Dead. That's what the scripture says. In case you get so focused on, well, it's about faith. It's what I believe. What do you believe? Well, go to my church's website. There's a statement of faith. That's what I believe. That does not fool the devil, folks. How you live your life will show what you actually believe and what you don't believe. And we're at a point now where, where the Lord says, I need you to live your faith. We, we, have, we have bought this idea that it's just about faith, it's just about theology, and the Lord has allowed these terrible things to happen to wake up his remnant and to say, brothers and sisters, please, please wake up now because it will be too late in five minutes. You will not have a voice in five minutes. And by the way, the Lord wants you to do this. This is not some political thing. He is thinking about the kids that are being trafficked across the border. He is thinking about the families being destroyed by fentanyl. Uh, he is thinking uh, uh, about how a critical theory, whether critical race or other, is, is destroying minds and undermining truth uh, in the academy. Uh, it, it, all across our culture. The, the Lord has called us to be the answer to that. We know that he is the answer to that. But when he had ascended into heaven, he didn't like wrap up the heavens like a scroll. He basically said, okay, now I'm going to send down my Holy Spirit and you, the church, are going to be my hands and feet in history until I decide it's over. And I know that their voices say, it's over. We're under judgment. We're done. I got to tell you, folks, those voices are the voice of the devil because they are saying, don't fight. Don't fight against this. It's useless. Don't fight. I'm here to tell you the Lord wants you to fight until he tells you it's over. And I, I generally believe, I don't think that this is a, a Pollyanna um, um, optimism, okay? If you had asked George Washington in 1776 at the Battle of Brooklyn, do you think you will prevail? What do you think in the natural? Well, you think you're going to win? The answer would be, I don't know. With God's help, I might. So I will keep fighting. And if the Lord gives me the victory, he will give me the victory. But in the natural, there was no reason to expect victory. I believe that's where we are now. If the church will arise and be the church, if the church will stand now, I believe the Lord will give us the victory. And if we take the values of the scripture and bring them to bear on every issue and do not fear those voices who say it's over. Do not fear those voices who tell you, you better shut up, you'll get in trouble. If we will live heroically, we will see God move in a way that we haven't even dreamt about. Because I say at the end of the day, folks, you either trust the Lord or you die. You trust the Lord with everything. This is an opportunity now in history for us to trust the Lord. So the reason I wrote the book Letter to the American Church is to say, church, it's not over. The Lord wants us to live for him in a way that we have not. We've been so blessed. We've been able to get away without being controversial and stuff. The Lord says, well, I'm going to bring you some controversy. And now I expect you to live out your faith. You're going to have to depend on me in a way you've never depended on me before. But guess what? I am the Lord, your God, and you can depend on me. And if you lean on me, you will see me move in a way in your nation that I've never moved before. 
but it is up to the church, which means it's up to you and to me. It is up to us. God bless you. Do not miss this opportunity. God bless you. God bless you.